Joe Elliott from Def Leppard, so good to have you here. It's good to be here. All right, so um, if the sun shines a little brighter today, if today seems a little better, there are two good reasons. One, uh, you've just uh, announced a summer tour. Uh, you're going uh, out with Journey this summer. And two, uh, at, at long last, the Def Leppard catalog is available digitally. It is. Uh, so I, d I don't know if I can Every do Every single song, <laughs> everything. Um, I don't know if I can be the uh, first one to report to you that uh, this makes going to the gym that much better. But uh, I will say the, the bonus disc on uh, Pyromania, there's a, at the end, there's this live version of uh, the Creedence Clearwater Revival uh, song, Traveling Man, with Brian May on guitar. That's right, yeah. And that made getting up and going to the gym this morning worthwhile for me. Yeah, that was fun because when we grew up as Queen fans and Brian was in LA and came down to the uh, sound tech and just brought his gear with him. He said, I'm gonna get up and play with you guys. And you know, we were, we were just gobsmacked really. And he's, was that we the were, first time I remember standing right at the back, empty hall, and he's up, up on the stage playing photograph. Brian May playing photograph, you know, and we're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they've arrived then, you know. Is there more wonderful goodies like that uh, that you've discovered going through the vaults as you've prepared uh, the digital releases or i'm sure there's more than we've discovered but we did discover a few little bits and bobs you know there's a lot of things that aren't up yet that will come out um we found a a live recording that we did in oxford at the new theater on a british tour the on through the night tour mm. which we're totally forgotten about so we're having it all transferred from the tapes all flaky so we're having it transferred into digital so we can get it mixed and see what it sounds like. So I think it'd be good to put out um, a kind of a live recording that's got Pete Willis and Steve Clark on it because it's just an era that's not been really covered much right. other than on two records. Um, so that'd be, that'd be interesting for the fans, I suppose. But we did find that um, the, the lost session from about 10 years ago. And we just couldn't remember where we did it, why we did it. <laughs> But it was obviously around the year time, the air album, because we did rock on. But there was things like we re-recorded Love and Eight Collide, which is actually better than the album version, I think. And uh, there's Let It Go on there, Heartbreak, Fooling, maybe. So, yeah, have it. There you go. I, I listened to it. I went, you know what? This is fine. It's, it's, I can't believe we didn't put it out because we didn't think it was good enough. I think it just got shelved for whatever reason. I forget. You know, history dictates sometimes that you do these things and then there's no need to release them or they get in the way of things. And then later on, they become more valuable, so. And and as time goes on, maybe you feel a little more free and easy and relaxed about letting letting the world hear that music. Well, yeah, but there was no point in putting it out before, but now that we're doing the whole catalog, it actually has its value. You know, you can't just put out a, a six track live, you know, a studio, it's, it's a session really, it's not live. It's recorded live in the studio is what it was just put it out for no reason because it would just be a bit weird but it has a value putting it out today because it's part of the entire catalog you know you, you guys were one of the last if not the last big holdout for streaming for yeah, downloads i think probably the last i think yeah. really right they i mean this is this is people have been waiting for it they've been fiending for it they've got it now they have really <laughs> oh, you know like i don't I know about that but oh I, I mean there, there's a demand you must know that uh i, I mean uh, and you as a band, kept up with technology, recording, you kept up with technology as you put your records out. This was a technological shift that, that you sat out for various different we reasons. Sat, yeah, for ver that's what it was. It was various different reasons. Most of them were nothing to do with technology. They were just down to practicality and the fact that there was no deal in place. Um, you can't just meet up with something on Monday and put a deal in place so that they're ready to go Monday evening. It, it took a long time to get both parties, which is Universal and Leopard, <coughs> to the table so and, and meet in the middle where we were both happy with basically the compromise of whatever it was going to be. <coughs> they were going to make offers and we were either going to accept them or not. Um, we wanted to get everything under the one umbrella as well. So instead of it all coming out in dribs and drabs, we wanted it to all all be there in, you know, from 79, the Def Leppard EP, right up to the last album. We wanted everything together. And to do that just takes a long time. The negotiations take a long time. We didn't want to do them while we're out on the road because you, you're not, you, your head's not in it. 
Mm. You know, you've got to sit down and go through everything. And when somebody's tapping you, you're going, sound check, photo session, meet and greet, gig. You know, you can't really concentrate on doing stuff. So we wanted, we, we waited until the tour was over and we really got into it. We finished, the tour finished by late towards the end of June. And although negotiations were well underway by then, they, we really went to town once everybody got home, settled down. And everybody's just got time to breathe and concentrate on nothing but this. Go through all the archive stuff. Then once we'd done that, we had to go in and remaster everything. So we had, we had, we had to get everything and so it all matched. It, we, it, it's it a digital a release. Matter, it wasn't just a matter of getting the deal in place. No, it's no, not it like everything. you're sitting down and say, getting out your calculator and sharpening your pencil. And it saying, was sitting down with Ronan, our, our sound guru, as we like to call right. him, and going through everything and make sure that all the levels were... Th so that it's, it's technically all set up for digital because before everything was just set up for cd or whatever you know vinyl um this gave us the opportunity to go through everything with a fine tooth comb from the ep all the way through on through the night right up to the last album and again it doesn't happen overnight so but but you had worked on a, a remastered hysteria last year for a yeah. 30th anniversary and we, yeah so we'd had to stop to do that <laughs> and then you know there was a bunch and then okay. we had to same thing with the detroit thing as well i mean you know th we've been working on this for a while mm. Under the, under, under the radar. Yeah, under the radar, you know, behind the curtains, we like to call it. But um, once we got everything in place, then it made mo a lot more sense to hold off until this year and then make the big announcement today. And then it becomes an event, not just a, oh, this stuff's out. We wanted it to just be explosive. You know, we love events. We've always liked to make a big splash. That's why I don't do the tweeting thing, because I don't think everybody needs to know on a daily basis what my breakfast was. But what did you have for breakfast, Joe? Let's, and then as I, long I as we're talking about it. I do something like this, and, and it trends, because I, I do it so <laughs> infrequently that it's like, oh, he's here. He's still alive, you know. Um, and so it, to, to tie it in with the release, the, 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 the release of the catalog and the tour, right. and, the, and also for further afield, the British tour, where we're going to actually be playing the Hysteria album uh, in... in in its total, you know, like we did in Vegas next de in this December coming, right. it was a big splash of to put all three bits of information out in the one day. So the 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 uh, other bit of information that we're talking about is the tour coming up uh, with Journey. This is the second time you've toured with them. Uh, yeah, we toured with them in 2006, but this is going to be bigger and better because it's 60 shows, at least so far. Uh, Ten of those are stadiums, so it you know it just sounded like a good idea. I was doing press with Neil. Sean this morning and we would it was like we just picked up where we left off 12 years ago and that's 12 years ago I mean putting that into con you know context the Beatles were together for eight <laughs> 12 years ago we toured you know um and it was just like we'd never been away really it was it was great you know uh you mentioned that was uh, 12 years ago uh you guys work you work steadily I was going back and taking a look I think the last time you took a year off from touring was 2010. Yeah, and I did a Down and Outs album that year as okay. well. So, so you, I didn't you, really you take didn't a year off. didn't really take time off. Mm -mm. Um, how, uh, how do you keep at it? I mean, I, I, I know that, that you, you've said before you don't get tired going out and singing the, the hits, but what keeps it fresh? You're going out every year and playing. The audience and is this get, is hard work. Yeah, the audience gets bigger each time we mm. go out, which is, you know, that, that helps. It would be a little disheartening if they were getting smaller and smaller and right. smaller, but it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which is, you know, I don't know why, I'll be honest, but <laughs> I'm not going to knock it, you know. <laughs> but I think maybe because we do work that hard and we, we bring ourselves, you know, into this touring summer schedule on almost a yearly basis. Right. And I think people just want to come back. It's the music industry has changed since we, we joined it in 1980 when there was, um, the roadmap was make an album, tour, make an album, tour, make an album, tour. And you'd go on tour to promote an album. And, you know, essentially maybe 10, 15 years ago, it actually became like put an album out to promote a tour. Right. Um, the whole thing changed. And then it's okay to be a legacy act now. You've got to remember that in... Now, you don't, now you don't even need the album. You, the you tour don't itself need is album. the thing that people we want. Got, we've, we've got no album for this summer. We had for the last two tours. We were right. actively promoting the, the, the last studio record. But in you know, in, it's it's people might not know this or remember it, depending on how young or old you are. But in nineteen seventy six, when punk rock came along in the UK, it came along to kind of destroy what came before it. 
and there were bands that were like over the hill at the age of 28. Yep. And it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you think about now and it's like, it, it's, that's all gone away. In fact, the older you are, the cooler you are to a point, you know, because you've got a legacy to, to you've uphold. Got a, you've got a history to draw on and you also have those songs. Yeah, and I think that, that's another thing as well. Is, you know, we would do work hard and we work hard at trying to be good. And we're also aware of the fact that in this day and age, you can't mess up anymore. And you only take one guy to face plant and it's on YouTube for the rest of your life. So, you know, wear sensible shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to go back. You, I think the first tour of America was 1980. Yeah. You're, um, you're uh, opening for Scorpions and Ted Nugent. Correct. Uh, and I, I'd read a, a really funny thing that, uh, that you said. Uh, you know, we, we had half an hour on stage, 23 hours to kill. We were broke. And the girls bought us beer, and many, and yeah, and dinner, and and many other things. How how? <laughs> okay, uh, and how's, how's? We were English. You'd be amazed what that accent does in Texas. What what, what it does in Texas? Yeah, it wouldn't do a thing in England. Okay, <laughs> wouldn't touch you in England. And and was it talk just... like this in America? It's like you're cute. <laughs> Even with a bag on your head, you're cute. You know what I mean? So. But um. How things changed? It's, it's it's different now. I mean, you're leading different lives. You know, you're less li likely to be in the bar during downtime. More likely to be in the gym or somewhere. I wouldn't say that either. But, uh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in fairness, Phil's in the gym all the time. Oh yeah. Um, I join him mostly. I mean, right now, I'll be for to tell everybody. I'm not doing anything. I've just had rotator cuff surgery. Oh. So I'm not doing anything for the next three or four weeks. Um, it'll be fine. <laughs> I had this one done 15 years ago. What? So I fly a lot, and I'm just I'm one wing at the moment. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't spend a great deal of time in the bar, but I do. I mean, we go out. You know, if it's a day off tomorrow, we'll have a drink that night before sort of thing. Um, the fact the last time I was in, in a bar on tour was in Chicago just because I and Maiden were in town, and I hadn't seen Steve Harris in years. And we went down and had a drink, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, this is an instrument and I've got to watch it and it breaks down if you damage it. I mean, I, I, I lost my voice about two years ago really badly, but it came back fine, you know, but it just needed proper rest. Um, but that was because I had pneumonia and that, that didn't help us. <laughs> no, I mean, there's there's no combating illness, but what do you what do you actually do to, to keep the voice? I shut mean, up. What's that? I shut up. <laughs> I sing and I go to bed and I watch film. I watch movies a lot because... They kind of encourage you not to talk because you want to watch them and listen to them and stuff like that. But, you know, you just got to be clever and sensible about it. We don't do three in a row or four in a row. We do two at most, you know. Um, for us, it's all about doing a good show, not doing as millions of shows. He's doing good ones uh, as best we can. You, everybody gets ill, you know. I mean, whether it be a singer loses his voice or stupidly a guitarist cutting his finger, slicing an orange. I mean, it happens and then, then they can't play, you know. Daft things happen to people occasionally. But you just have to protect yourself. It's like everything else, you know. If, if, th there are things you can't help. If you walk into an elevator and somebody sneezes in your face, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that. Same with airplanes. You've got to get on a plane to get somewhere. Chances are it can go wrong, you know. So, you, But you can't walk around with a mask on. You know, uh, you mentioned... Well, you could, but you'd look stupid. You yeah. know? I mean, it's 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 a very distinct look. Uh, yeah. It's a kind Spider -Man of Michael mask. Jackson look. Yeah, or, or Spider Man. That Spider -Man, would work. That sure. would work. Yeah. Hey, there's Joe Elliott. <laughs> yeah. No, you uh, just you've got to be careful. I mean, it does. It's not just sing. It's everybody. You know, when you when you're out on the road, you've got to be as fit as possible. And sometimes it just you know, touring in winter would be hell for me. Uh, I've done it, and it doesn't work. You know, um, but it's you know, if you can manage yourself. You can get through. You don't have to be 100% all the time. We always, Phil likes to say 85%. If you're at 85%, most people wouldn't notice the 15% that we would notice. Right. And then that's spread over five people. You don't even notice it at all. You know. Um, we, we mentioned a little earlier, uh, you're, you're touring. There's not a new record this time out. Uh, you released one in 2015. I, I think you had said that uh, you went into the studio with one or two songs to see what would happen. And... 12 songs later, you knew you had a record. Um, have you been doing any songwriting, any recording? I have, but nothing to do with Def Leppard, no. Mm. What are you working on? Down and Out's third album. I've, we've written this one. 
Mm. Um, so that's interesting because they were all songs I've written on the piano, which is obviously comes with a different headspace to writing for Leopard. Um, plus the fact that if, if it was a Def Leppard record, it would be me, Sav, Phil, Vivian, and, and even Rick will be writing with this one. It was just me writing for a down and out album on a, mostly on a piano. Um, and that's because I've been trying to get this record done for four years, but the, you know, the big machine won't let me stop, you know, right. which is great because I have no problem with that. But on the downtime that we get, that's where you have to do your side thing. So Phil's got, you know, Delta Deep, Vivian's got Last In Line, um, Rick's got his art and Sav doesn't do anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> and he's happy like that, you know, he's, right. it's fine. Um, but we'll, Leopard will, we'll, we'll, we will write again. In fact, we are actively writing as individuals. I know Phil's got some stuff on the go, I've got some stuff on the go, but we haven't presented it to each other yet because it's not in any kind of finished form. And there's no rush. That's the great thing. As you, as you mentioned with the last album, we didn't even set out to make a record, which is why it turned out so brilliant, I think. It was such an, an organic situation. We, we went in to do three songs. And when we all said, okay, who's got what? Everybody had three songs each yeah. or, or more, you know, so we ended up with 12. Right. Um, and then while we were working on those 12, we wrote two more. So we had 14. And all of a sudden we had this accidental album. You can't beat making an accidental record because there's no planning, you know. Right. There's no A&R man, there's no where's the single, there's no it's got to be finished on a certain day. There was none of that. And we just went in to have fun. And it's like, it's like all that experience that we've had making records, all kind of going back to like making your first record almost, right. you know, it was really weird. It was it was such a great time because there was no pressure on us, no clock running, money wasn't an issue. There was no label to deliver it to. We were just going to make a record and see how it turned out. Well, I want to make a, a little time now for uh, questions from the uh, audience. Uh, I know we've got one right here in the front. Hi, I'm just hello. I'm wondering, in your long su successful career, are there any moments that you would you could happily relive over and over? There's got to be at least one. Live over and over. Uh, yeah, pretty much just. Going on stage, it, when the when the house lights go down, the best part for me of being in a band is playing live. I don't think anybody ever kind of came to terms with the fact that they were going to be in a band as a teenager. Went, I can't wait to spend three years in the studio. I just don't think that ever happens. You just you want to be in a band because you've seen other people in bands and you've seen them either on stage or on TV, and it's the it's the performing live. It's the, I don't know. It's the adulation. It's the narcissism. I don't know what you want to call it. But um, just getting up there and, I mean, sometimes me and Phil, we stand on one side of the stage before the house lights go down and Vivian and, and Sav are on the other side and Rick's pacing in between. <laughs> and sometimes the curtain there, it's got holes in it, you know, so me and Phil are just peeking through. Ooh, it's full. It looks, like it looks pretty good out there tonight, you know. And then the lights go down at the end of whichever song we follow and the, cr the, cr the roar goes up. That's probably the best bit better than even performing. It's the, it's the anticipation of what's about to come. It's the thrill of the chase, you know. We've got time for uh, one more question. Uh, there we go. How do you get your inspiration for songwriting and uh, uh, what is the process of creating a hit? Uh, is it long or sometimes it's short? There is no written rule for writing a hit. Most people don't know how they write hits. That's why there's so many one-hit wonders. You know, anybody can write a great three-minute piece of work Write 25 or 30 of them. That's where, it, that's where you've got to tip your hat to McCartney and Lennon and you know Elton John or Queen or any, whoever it is that just write hit after hit after hit. We've been lucky that we've had a few. I don't know how, they just, they just come. It's, it's lightning in a bottle. Tom Petty called it fishing. You, t you throw in the rod and you see if you get a bite. I used to say it's, you put your hand up and catch something. Sometimes you catch something, sometimes you don't. There is no rule or rhyme or reason to why it works and why it doesn't. We've written some great songs that did not connect. And we've had hits with songs that I didn't think were good enough to be hits. So, you know, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to uh, leave it there. Joe, thanks so much. We're looking forward to seeing you on the road this summer. And thanks for being with us. Thank you.